If you're a relatively new software engineer and have made your way through the foundational concepts like data structures and algorithms, what should you focus on next? The common answer here is distributed systems. While there is merit to that answer, I do think that jumping from data structures and algorithms directly to concepts and distributed systems is a mistake. First, because concepts in distributed systems are often difficult to learn on your own, especially if you don't already work on large-scale projects that are distributed across multiple regions. And second, there is too much of a disconnect between concepts in data structures and the ones in distributed systems, making the transition difficult and often overwhelming for software engineers. So for that reason, my advice is to start by learning API development first. APIs are everywhere. They're foundational to nearly every modern application. They're very easy to learn on your own. And best of all, they offer a much smoother, more practical transition into the complexities of distributed systems. So in this video, I will explain in detail why you should learn API development before delving into distributed systems and provide a solid guide for you to get started with APIs. All right, let's begin. Hi folks, my name is Utsav. If you're new here, I'm a software engineer based in Seattle. I have about 20 years of experience in the industry where I've held diverse software engineering roles and created a few tech startups. And I'm currently at Microsoft. If you're new to this channel, my goal here is to help you get the best out of your career by mentoring you around five key pillars, technical skills, engineering efficiency, mindset, entrepreneurship, and financial freedom. So if that sounds interesting, please consider subscribing and follow me at Engineering with Utsav for behind the scenes and monthly Q and A's. Let's start by talking a bit more about why APIs should be the next step in your learning journey after data structures and algorithms. See, regardless of which part of the stack you're working on, whether it's front-end, back-end, or even specialized areas like AI or ML, APIs are an integral part of your daily work as a software engineer. Understanding how to implement and interacting with them is a skill that transcends programming languages, frameworks, and even job roles. Let's look at some examples of how you will use APIs in your day-to-day -day job. If you're working on front-end, you'll often need to fetch data from a server using APIs. For example, when building a weather app, you might use an API to get real-time weather data based on the user's location. Or an e-commerce site, you'll need to interact with APIs to display um, product listings, manage shopping carts, or process payments. Um, knowing how to effectively use APIs allows you to connect your front-end application to the broader ecosystems of services and data. On the back-end, APIs are essential for building services that other applications or clients can consume. For instance, if you're developing a RESTful API for a blogging platform, you'll create end points to handle actions like posting new content, um, fetching posts, and managing user comments. This not only helps in structuring your application, but also exposing functionalities to other developers who might integrate your service into their own applications. Even in specialized fields like AI and machine learning, APIs play a crucial role. Let's say you've trained a machine learning model to predict housing prices. You might want to use an API to deploy that model as a service, allowing other applications to send data and receive predictions. Tools like TensorFlow Serving or cloud services like AWS SageMaker or Azure ML provide APIs to interact with models, making it easier to integrate AI capabilities into larger systems. Not only are APIs everywhere, they're also relatively easier to learn on your own compared to distributed systems. You don't need a large-scale project or a team to start experimenting with APIs. You can begin by working with public APIs like those provided by OpenWeather, X, or Spotify, and build small but real-world projects with them. This hands-on experience not only reinforces what you've learned, but also uh, boosts your confidence as you tackle more complex topics later on. Learning APIs also naturally prepares you for distributed systems. As you delve into advanced topics in API, like rate limiting, load balancing, fault tolerance, you'll be laying groundwork for understanding how distributed systems work. These topics are crucial when your application scales, and knowing them in the context of APIs makes the leap to distributed systems much more manageable. Now that we've established why APIs should be your next learning focus, let's dive into some common types of APIs you'll encounter as a software engineer and how they're used in day-to-day -day work. 
This includes not just building her own APIs, but also consuming third-party APIs, which are equally crucial in modern development. First up, we have REST APIs, which are the most common and widely used. REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer, is an architectural style that uses standard HTTP methods like GET, POST, PUT, and DELETE to interact with resources on a server. For example, if you're building a to-do list application, a REST API could provide endpoints for adding new tasks, marking them as complete, or even deleting them. In a front-end context, let's say you're working on a dashboard that displays real-time stock market data. You could likely use a REST API to fetch this data from a financial service, updating the UI as the new data becomes available. REST APIs are everywhere because they're simple, stateless, and easy to work with, making them a go-to choice for most web applications. Next, we have SOAP APIs, which stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. Unlike REST, SOAP is a protocol and comes with strict standards using XML message formatting. SOAP APIs are often used in enterprise environments where security, reliability, and transaction management is critical. For instance, in banking systems where multiple operations need to be completed successfully before committing a transaction, SOAP APIs ensure that every step follows a strict protocol. Imagine you're working in a large financial institution that handles millions of transactions daily. SOAP APIs would be used to ensure that each transaction is processed uh, securely and reliably with built-in error handling and compliance with strict industry standards. While SOAP might be less popular for new applications, it's still very much in use where these factors are non-negotiable. Next up is GraphQL, which offers a more flexible approach to querying data. Unlike REST, where you might overfetch or underfetch data, GraphQL allows you to request exactly what you need, all in a single request. This is particularly useful in scenarios with complex data relationships. For example, a social media platform might use GraphQL to fetch a user's profile information, their posts and comments in a single query. Let's say you're building a mobile app where bandwidth is limited and performance is crucial. Using GraphQL, you can optimize the data fetch to retrieve only the necessary information, reducing the load time and improving the user experience. This fine-grained control over data fetching makes GraphQL a powerful tool in modern applications. And finally, we have gRPC, which stands for Google Remote Procedure Call. gRPC is designed for high-performance, low-latency communication between services. It uses HTTP2 and protocol buffers to serialize data, making it both fast and efficient. gRPC is particularly useful in microservices architectures where services need to communicate with each other quickly and reliably. Um, let's say you're working on a large-scale application with dozens of microservices, each responsible for a different part of the system, like user authentication, payment processing, and notification delivery. gRPC would be the ideal choice here for inter-service communication, ensuring that data is transferred quickly and with minimal overhead even as the system scales. These are just some of the types of popular web-based APIs. There are a ton of others that you could be building or interacting with. You could be working on operating systems where you'll work with Windows API or POSIX API. You could also work with hardware and interact with APIs like the Android Camera API for capturing images or the OpenGL API for rendering 2D or 3D graphics on a GPU. Or you could work with browsers and interact with the DOM APIs for the rendering tree. Now let's quickly talk about third-party APIs because as a software engineer, understanding how to consume APIs is as important as developing them. These are APIs provided by other companies that you can integrate into your applications to add functionality without building everything from scratch. This is a crucial part of modern software development because it allows you to leverage powerful services without reinventing the wheel. Here are some common examples. If you're developing an application that needs AI capabilities, you might use APIs from platforms like OpenAI, Google Cloud AI, or IBM Watson. These APIs allow you to integrate advanced features like natural language processing, image recognition, or recommendation systems into your app without needing to develop complex AI models from scratch. Data APIs are another example. Services like X API, Meta, Graph API or financial data APIs like AlphaVantage provide access to vast amounts of data that you can use in your applications. Whether it's pulling in social media data, tracking stock prices, or analyzing trends, these APIs give you access to real-time data that can make your application even more dynamic and insightful. And then there are search APIs. These allow you to add powerful search capabilities to your applications. Whether you need to implement a simple keyword search or a complex full-text search across large data sets, these APIs handle the heavy lifting, enabling 
enable you to focus on other aspects of your application. Speaking of search capabilities, let me quickly talk about the Brave Search API, who have also kindly sponsored this video. Brave is one of the few global independent search providers and the fastest growing search engine since Bing. And the Brave Search API gives you access to high quality data, enabling you to build everything from search engines to AI apps. This API provides easy, intuitive, and consistent data structure and full access to an index of billions of pages with just a single call. Brave Search also fetches tens of millions of web pages every day, so you can be rest assured that the data is up to date with recent events. There are a ton of use cases for something as flexible as the Brave Search API. Some examples are custom search engines, content or news aggregation platforms, information dashboards, autocomplete, spell check, LLM powered applications, and AI assistance. Brave also added Code LLM this year to their search engine, which offers programmers an option to get AI code snippets within the search results, along with step-by-step -step explanations and citations of the sources for reference and validation. This makes Brave one of the better browsers for software developers, and even better, access to code LLM will be available via the Search API in the near future. So definitely keep an eye out for that one. Brave Search API also has flexible, transparent, and affordable pricing models to fit everyone's needs. And best of all, you can get started for free. So definitely visit brave.com API and try it out. The link will be in the description below. Also, let them know that I sent you. Thanks again to Brave for sponsoring this video. All right, so once you've got the basics of APIs down and start delving into some of the more advanced concepts, you'll find that these concepts not only make your APIs more robust, but also set the stage for understanding distributed systems. Let's look at some of those concepts. Rate limiting is a technique used to control the number of requests a user or a client can make to your API in a given time frame. As your API sees more request volume, rate limiting is crucial for preventing abuse, ensuring fair usage, and protecting your server from being overwhelmed. As a real world example, Imagine that you've built an API that provides real-time sports scores. Without rate limiting, a single user or a bot could flood your API with requests, potentially crashing your servers. By implementing rate limiting, you ensure that every user has fair access to your service while also protecting your own infrastructure. There are various algorithms you can use to add rate limiting to your API, such as fixed window, sliding window, token bucket, and leaky bucket, some of which you might have already come across when learning about data structures and algorithms. And this concept is also directly applicable to distributed systems where resource management is a key. Next concept is load balancing, which is a technique used to distribute incoming requests across multiple servers. Load balancing ensures that no single server becomes a bottleneck, which is essential for maintaining the availability and performance of your API. As a real world example, consider an e-commerce platform uh, during a big sale event with thousands of users hitting the site at the same time, load balancing helps distribute the load across multiple servers, ensuring that the site remains responsive. Load balancing is a critical concept in distributed systems where you'll often be dealing with multiple services that need to work together seamlessly. Understanding this at an API level will help you transition much smoothly into the world of distributed systems where you'll come across many more load balancing concepts like even load distribution, session persistence, health check overheads, consistent hashing, failover, and disaster recovery. Caching is another essential technique which is used for improving the performance of your API by storing copies of responses and reusing them for future requests. This reduces the need to repeatedly process the same data, saving time and server resources. As a real-world example, imagine you've built a news aggregator that fetches articles from multiple sources. Instead of making a fresh request every time a user visits, you can cache the results and serve them quickly, only updating the cache at regular intervals. This reduces the load on your service and improves the user experience. And needless to say, caching is also a key strategy in distributed systems for optimizing data retrieval and reducing latency. This knowledge will directly transfer over as you learn about distributed architectures where you'll learn about various caching strategies like write through, write around, read through, and cache aside. I can keep going with many other topics in APIs that make the perfect bridge between data structures and algorithm and distributed systems, but I hope that this is enough to make my point clear that learning API development is a practical 
practical next step after you've grasped the fundamentals of data structures and algorithms. APIs are integral to nearly every aspect of modern software development, and by learning them, you'll gain hands-on experience that prepares you for more complex topics in distributed architectures. Not only that, as you explore advanced API topics, you'll find yourself naturally transitioning over to the world of distributed systems with a solid foundation. If you found this video useful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos that I make with the aim of helping you holistically grow as a software engineer. If you need a refresher on data structures and algorithms, check out my roadmap video. And if you want to get a head start with distributed systems, check out my number one book recommendation for it. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.